We have a great program tonight. Uh, we're going to talk about a brown marmorated stink bug, spotted lanternfly, the Asian giant hornet. Um, but we're going to start off uh, bringing a colleague in from Cornell. He's going to give us uh, some exciting news about uh, jumping worms. And we've got some real experts in the house tonight. We're really fortunate to have uh, Dr. Kyle Wickings from Cornell and Dr. George Hamilton, uh, two of uh, really knowledgeable pe people in the area of, of the subject that we're dealing with tonight. I'm excited about tonight because we've been getting questions uh, throughout uh, the entire spring and summer on these two subjects, and they've been pretty hot uh, in the press. And it's finally good to get a chance to actually deal with these two topics from uh, two renowned experts in, in the area. Without further ado, I'm going to get started with our first speaker, which we're very excited to have. Um, Dr. Kyle Wickings. Wickings is an associate professor of soil arthropod ecology and turf grass entomology at Cornell University. Uh, he's been interested in improving basic knowledge of soil invertebrates to help minimize damage by root feeding pests and simultaneously preserving the biodiversity and function of beneficial soil organisms. And he's going to talk to you tonight about Asian jumping worms in the lawn and the landscape settings. So Kyle, I'm going to turn it over to you and go ahead and turn your video on so we can see it and ready to get started. Thanks. Sure. Thanks, Bill. And thanks a lot for having me. This is a good opportunity, so I appreciate it. It's a pretty timely, timely issue right now. We've, uh, you know, when I started at Cornell back in 2013, I, I got my first call about Asian jumping worms, and they haven't stopped. They've just sort of increased from there. So uh, it's certainly a growing problem that we're seeing in the Northeast, especially. So, um, <clears throat> so what I wanted to do tonight was uh, give a bit of an overview on the biology and ecology of the jumping worm, and talk about what we know in terms of their damage in the general realm of gardens, lawns, and landscape settings, and then talk about uh, what management practices we have out there now that are available. I can tell you now it's not going to be a very satisfying list, but we'll do what we can to cover some of the, the practical things that you can do to minimize the spread at, um, at least. So, so I'll just start off by um, acknowledging some of the really great cooperators I have on this. Uh, a working group that I'm in at Cornell called J-Worm, that's all about Asian jumping worms, as well as a number of cooperators that contributed directly to this talk. So Brad Herrick from UW-Madison at the Arboretum has been doing a lot of work out there with jumping worms. Walt Nelson with Cooperative Extension in, at Cornell. Ella Maddie, who was a great summer intern that got to work with jumping worms with us and had a really good time. And then some uh, other folks that do some really great earthworm ecology at different universities. So Joseph Gores, Kathy Slavins, Chihan Chang, Bruce Snyder, and Matt Callahan. So they've all contributed slides and content for this. So we really appreciate that from them. So I just want to give some background on um, the jumping worm as far as origin and general biology. Um, you always know something's typically a problem when it has a lot of really strange common names. And the Asian jumping worm really fits this, this bill well. So in addition to Asian jumping worm, you hear them called crazy snake worms, um, Alabama jumpers, green stink worms. It, it just there, there's so many common names for this worm. It, it's uh, it's pretty comical to read them all. But uh, the species that we'll talk about, there's actually multiple species in the group, and um, for some practical reasons, that's important to know. Um, but they're thought to originate from Korea and Japan. And collectively, we call this whole group of earthworms the pheretomoids, and they differ a lot from some of the typical European earthworms that you see around your landscapes. And we'll talk about how they differ and how you recognize them. So in North America, we've got 16 species of the Asian jumping worm group, um, but three primary species up here in the Northeast. So this is um, a, a taxa that was introduced actually back in the 1950s, but we really didn't have the same type of problems then that we do now, and we're not really sure exactly what's driving those, those changes either. So this is a, a really great slide from Brad Herrick at, um, at University of Wisconsin-Madison, and it just shows some of the key distinctions among the, the taxa. So the Asian jumping worm, which uh, I'm hoping you guys can see my cursor here in, in the screen share, um, the group A. Memphis and some of the relatives are um, about three to seven inches long. When they're adults, they get up to about seven. Most of the ones that I see are around five inches, but they differ a lot from most of the European earthworms that we're seeing in that they're typically, as adults, a little bit shorter. Uh, regarding the life cycle, typically, once we get, especially up here in the Northeast and, and where some of you folks are from, once we get to the end of the season, a lot of the European species will burrow deeper into the soil and they'll make a little cell to overwinter in. Um, and so those adults will actually survive the winter. 
Asian jumping worms are very different from that, and what will happen with them is they actually, um, most of the adults will die. And there's some exceptions to this actually down on the coast where they'll actually, as adults, survive the winter just fine. But um, for the most part, the adults will die off and their eggs are what survive winter. So that these eggs are within this leathery cocoon. They're really resistant to desiccation and, and shifts in temperature, um, which makes them very successful in this, in this habitat. They can really survive well. They can dry out completely and be rehydrated um, and, and hatch. So um, that's a very big distinction because it really ties into when you start to see the jumping worms in the landscape, which we'll talk about shortly as well. The coloration is pretty different on these worms. Most of the Europeans that we see around here tend to be sort of a pinkish reddish color, whereas the Asian jumping worms you can see have a brown hue to them. Um, typically, this is just on the back side of the worm. It's not pretty, very easy to tell what's the back and, and front of a worm necessarily, but they, they are a little bit darker on one side than the other. The next important thing is this feature called the clitellum on the earthworm, and that's really where all the reproductive organs of the earthworm are held. And on the European taxa, I'm sure you've all seen this on an earthworm. A typical adult earthworm will have this. But on the European species, like nightcrawlers, the red wigglers that we have as compost worms, it sort of bulges out and it really sort of protrudes from the side of the earthworm. Um, and if you look on the bottom of the earthworm, it's not complete. It's almost like one of those metal bracelets that you snap on your arm where it's, there's a gap on the bottom of it. And that's exactly how the clitellum looks on one of the European worms. But with the Asian jumping worm, it's, it's a really uniform white cuff that wraps around the entire um, the entirety of the worm, and it's really uniform in its width across the board. It tends to be a little brighter, so it's kind of a milky white color to it. Um, and you see that on Amenthus, it's a lot closer to the head of the worm. So with the Asian jumping worms, this clitellum is, looks like it's right up towards the end of the worm, whereas with the European worms, it's a little further back on the earthworm, so, so another distinction that you'll see. Um, behavior, this is really where things get uh, characteristic, and you can really separate them. What looks can look very similar to a European earthworm in behavior looks incredibly different. And a lot of people ask how they know if they've got one, they've got a worm that seems really active. And I just say you'll know it when you see it because it, they're so incredibly more active than, than the European worms. It's when you get one, it's almost hard to hold on uh, onto in your hands when you collect one, they're that active. So, so it's sort of the snake-like movement that is, is uh, hard to mistake for anything else. So. Um, I'll just skip ahead to this bottom point here. One thing that we do see with these is when they're really active, they'll actually shed their tail segment. And we, we think that's actually deliberate to avoid predation. Um, but when you pick one up, it will very quickly turn into two worms and the, the rear section will fly out of your hand to the ground. So that's something that we see in the Asian jumping worms, but not in the European species. And then the last thing to mention here is the castings that the earthworms create. So this is really the fecal material of the earthworm. I'm sure everybody who gardens or picks up a handful of soil has seen earthworm casts. It's a little globular structure that earthworms create through defecating soil and organic matter out. And with species like Lumbricus, um, we see these as sort of dispersed little globs in the soil surface where they deposit this material out of their tunnels. But with Amenthus, as I'll show you in a couple slides here, it's really, they almost turn the upper layer of soil into like coffee grounds. And um, it's very, very noticeable. You can almost plunge your hand straight into the material. So this coffee ground appearance is very signature to the Asian jumping worm. And that's often the first thing that people notice before they see the worms. This is a video of the Asian jumping worm when I say you'll know it when you see it. This one didn't shed its tail when we, we uh, picked it up, but it, but it is something that's pretty common as well when you collect them. So this is a relatively small one and doesn't have the clitellum, so you really can't tell um, any of the traits on the clitellum, but that behavior is uh, unmistakable. Here's a picture of the castings. So on the right, this is a soil that has typical earthworm activity in it. I was looking earlier and I, I did find some castings in here. Um, be up here, there's some earthworm castings, this little glob by this, this twig, and then down here by these needles, there's some but if you look at this side over here, there's this uniform kind of composty coffee ground appearance to the soil. And you can literally scoop this very easily with your hands, whereas this soil over here is a little bit more compacted. Um, this is really one of the biggest things associated with problems with the Asian jumping worm. And these are actually all good things the worm is doing to the soil. They're enriching it in nitrogen, they're airifying it. These are all things that we talk about as benefits of earthworms. 
but they're doing it so aggressively that they over aerify the soil and you get this drought effect in the plants. Plants just have no continuity around the roots and they, they, um, they die from that really. Sometimes it's aerified so much that the plants literally fall over. So I'm sure many of you on the call have seen things like this if you're gardening in areas with jumping worms. So this is that signature appearance and it really doesn't take much poking around to find this if you're in an area with um, a lot of jumping worm activity. This is the life cycle of Asian jumping worms. Um, there's a, some variability to this, so um, just look at this as sort of a general overview of the life cycle, because uh, especially down on the coast, there's some variability if you're in protected culture at all under plastics. Uh, things can extend out or um, actually last over winter as well. But in general, we see that cocoons are what survive the winter. The adults tend to die below 40 degrees Fahrenheit or above 90 degrees, so they really don't survive a lot of extremes that well. Um, and it's really those cocoons that will survive. Once we get out to spring, we, we see cocoons hatch. And even up in upstate New York, it tends to be spring when this happens. Um, and this is pretty abrupt. We see this appearance of juveniles. Many people don't see the worms, though, because they're so small. And I'll show a slide of that next. Uh, it's a really small individual, and it, it's very easy to overlook. So what tends to happen is once you get to July, and right now, especially in August, is up in upstate, this is when things tend to first appear. And you start to see the adults really present and, and just almost like they came out of nowhere. Um, but it really, there was this gradation and development that happened. It's just is a lot more cryptic until the adults show up. From there, <clears throat> they reproduce and cocoons form, and they'll deposit them right into the soil. Um, this is a pretty wide array, a wide range of time where they're depositing cocoons in the soil. Some of those cocoons will hatch when we get to fall, and you will see ju juvenile jumping worms going into fall. Sometimes those will mature even further and survive winter, especially in moderate climates or, again, like I said, protected culture. But um, typically, once we get to that point, it's really just going to be the, the cocoons that were laid late that will survive and then and be present in spring to hatch again. And as I mentioned, some systems, there's this sort of buffering capacity that happens that'll extend the windows and make things happen outside of this range. But this is the general life cycle. And if you think of it, this is really different from the European earthworms. We see them really active in early spring. Here in, in the Finger Lakes area of New York, we'll see them, you get a, a thaw in the middle of winter, and earthworms will start coming out, and you'll see their, their burrows active, and they'll retreat when you shine a flashlight on them. Um, those are really the European species that we're seeing. The, the Asian jumping worms don't really do that, uh, especially in this area. So. so just to touch on reproduction a little bit for the sake of talking about some of the reasons these worms are really good at surviving and doing what they do. Um, the first is that <clears throat> they exhibit parthenogenesis, which basically means they can produce eggs um, and, and um, reproduce on their own. They don't need a sexual partner to do this. So this is pretty common and rare in invasive species, and this is something that the earthworms do. So not all earthworm species exhibit this, but the Asian jumping worms do. So it makes them pretty successful. And the next thing is this cocoon. So oh, I've been talking a lot about these cocoons. You know, what are they? So they're, they're essentially this leathery packet that's produced um, in a rubbery layer around the worm when it's reproducing. So it injects sperm and eggs into this thing, and then the cocoon turns leathery. Um, and it's shed from the worm. And inside of this, there can be multiple eggs, and oftentimes you'll have multiple earthworms hatch from these, usually just a couple, though. Um, and, but this outer coating, which we call the cocoon, is incredibly protect protective against temperature and moisture extremes. So they're cold hardy down to minus 40, um, and you really have to heat treat material if you want to kill cocoons. They look like soil. I mean, we can see them very well here, but they're really hard to pick out from bulk soil or compost. So trying to identify them by hand or manually uh, with your eyes is a really tricky thing to do, even if you're doing it via microscopy. They will float, but so does compost. So trying to float them out of soil, we've found, is, is a tricky thing to do as well. Um, when those hatch and the earthworms emerge, you can see this is a, a hatchling right here. Most of this body is translucent. You can only see it because there's soil in the gut. Uh, this is in centimeters, so it's about an inch long, this juvenile. It's very easy to overlook. So once these hatch in spring, you may have these everywhere and just not know that they're there um, until the, um, the more mature adults form, and uh, they're very noticeable at that point. And this tends to be around the same time when white grubs are coming back up into the root zone after winter um, and when insects are getting active in spring that that hatching happens. So this is the time when we're seeing lots of adult European worms at the soil surface, but this is just when Amenthus is actually hatching and, and getting a cycle going again. So a lot of people ask about, you know, how, why are they all of a sudden in my lawn and I've never seen them before? Um, there are some ways that on their own, these earthworms can um, 
dispersed pretty well around the, the, the landscape. So this is a typical landscape where I live. It's kind of a um, very urban uh, connected to rural environment and these forest patches that run through these areas. I have a rails to trails path back here. It's a really nice long strip of forest, really great habitat for dispersing that has these little fingers of forest that come out into people's lawns. And then from there, lots of hot spots that they can sort of um, play leapfrog to leave these forest edges and hop out into some of our habitats that are really great resources for the earthworms. So they can come from these forest edges into gardens, raised beds, landscaping beds, um, and municipal compost and mulch piles that are near forests from after chipping stumps and things like that. So really great places that they can reside. And then from there on, be moved um, to other sites uh, by people. So we think there are some pretty um, key routes that they're doing this through. The first one, which um, I think is probably the most apparent, is moving them around through moving vermicomposting worms or through moving fishing bait around. Now, oftentimes, the worm species that come along with these aren't you know, really keyed out taxonomically by specialists. And oftentimes the worms that you get aren't exactly the ones that are labeled um, or thought to be there. And down south, people will often use another species of jumping worm um, for fishing because of how active they are. So it's thought that this is a pretty important route by which people are moving them around. It's a really common practice where I grew up to dump your bait when you're done fishing. So um, I think that's a pretty, there's actually a golf course in Syracuse, New York last year that had jumping worms for the first time. And it happened on a green right near the creek where a bunch of people fish and typically dump their bait. So they think that's how they were introduced to the, the system. Um, the next is commercial potted plants or neighborhood plant swaps. Um, this is a really easy route to move them around as well because you're not just moving the plant, you're moving soil. And cocoons, they can be loaded with cocoons and even live earthworms. So you can see an adult in the bottom of this pot here that was moved with the pot. Um, so a really key route through which we can be moving them around our neighborhoods. Uh, the next is movement in lawn and yard waste. There's not as much data supporting this, but within forest systems, these species of worms really, really like leaf litter. That's their primary food source. So uh, there's lots of areas of people's lawns that, you know, the, the leaf litter will overwinter and you don't get it for a while and or butts up against the tree line and sits there all season. And that can be a really great habitat for Asian jumping worm. And if you do then manage that material and ship it off site, say to a municipal facility, it may or may not be heat treated. And that's a great source for somebody to come in and get some free compost, but then also possibly some Asian jumping worms for their property at the same time. And that kind of crosses over to their potential movement in compost and mulch. You know, there's a lot of these materials are not certified in any way for particular characteristics. Um, and, you know, even though we're heat treating a lot of this material above a temperature that would kill the worms and likely the cocoons as well, uh, especially municipal sources, this stuff can sit in windrows for quite a while because the demand fluctuates and, and varies. So you have different ages of material and they can be colonized from surrounding forest habitats. So they can be moved around in those materials as well. So Kyle, you already yeah. did answer one of the questions about them surviving in compost because of the volume of compost and the way that different materials are composted. Uh, so they can exist on the fringe of these compost piles, even if they get up to a certain temperature. Because um, we work a lot with compost at our facilities as well. Um, so unless, the, even if that heat does get up to what we typically see in a compost pile, you're saying that doesn't necessarily kill the jumping worms? That temperature usually will, Bill. So if it, if it gets up, uh, I think the range that I've seen was like 105 to 140 degrees. And if you okay. hit if you hit that range, you will kill them, and you can kill the cocoons as well. Um, the challenge is if the material sits and it's it's um, able to be colonized after the fact. So, oh, okay. Okay. Yeah, and that, that really is where it gets uncertain because you don't know how good of a route of introduction the worms have. They're very mobile, so it could be pretty quick if there's a source nearby. So, but that, that would be the distinction. And most work has shown that, especially with composts, you can successfully eradicate them with those temperatures. So. Also, another question I thought was a good one. Um, so these worms are actually um, so aggressive in terms of breaking down organics and aerifying soil that um, it kind of destroys the integrity of the soil to be able to hold plants down. So you're saying if there's enough of these worms around bushes or larger trees or whatever, that uh, that'll weaken the entire root mass so that that storm comes along and that could literally blow these plants right over. Mm. 
Yeah, I, I'm curious if any of the people on the call have seen uh, trees or shrubs come down um, in aerified soil like that. You know, I've seen smaller ornamentals die because of it, but I wouldn't be surprised to see shrubs actually toppled over in a storm that have really loose soil. So I would be curious to know if any of the, the callers have seen that or if any of you have. So uh, sorry about this overlap here. I'll try to talk through some of this stuff. I, I uh, didn't realize these wouldn't animate the way I intended, but um, most of the research we've done or we've seen in the past on Asian jumping worms have been done in forest systems. So forest systems are typically uh, where the invasion started and um, what they'll do is this really important leaf litter layer that's in the forest is really key for seedling recruitment uh, for native plants like Solomon seal and, and, and maples that are trying to recruit as seedlings underneath that canopy. But the Asian jumping worms will come in and they'll consume that entire leaf litter and they'll, they'll expose the soil surface below that. They'll expose tree roots that were typically protected before that uh, by subsiding the soil. And that opens the soils up for a whole range of problems, including pathogens that can sneak plant pathogens that can sneak in um, and sort of tips the balance for um, competitiveness of plants of uh, invasives versus, versus natives. So, that, and that's all been documented in forested systems. They're also, as I said, they ramp up soil nitrogen cycling. So it's kind of good because they're making it mineralized and plant available, but it's in this way that's so fast and so much that it just leaches out of the system because it's not really um, there when plants need it necessarily, so, or when microbes need it necessarily. Um, under my text over here, you can see uh, both landscape and nursery settings and turf grass settings. And these are the settings that we've been doing some work in um, within this landscape and nursery setting, uh, we've seen potted plants that the entire amount of volume of soil in those pots is completely turned into what looks like coffee grounds and that uh, the plants in them die just because they're overly aerified. And in turf settings, we've actually been looking to see if um, you actually get any benefits or detriments from them because we keep getting calls from people saying, I feel like they're eating my lawn and for some reason they're moving out of my, my mulch bed into the lawn. And so that's something that we've uh, tried to investigate. Um, and within this landscape setting, we looked at what effect do they have when you're composting or mulching a bed? What effects do they actually have on the system? Um, so we contrasted the decomposition of mulch, hardwood mulch, and compost. This was a municipal source of compost that didn't have any worms in it initially, but we either added worms, so those are the bars in brown, or let kept worms out, which are in green. And this is two months after we amended the soil with these materials. And after that two months, no effect in hardwood mulch. It's a lot harder to, to decompose, so no effect showed up here. Saw the same once we got to four months with the mulch. But even by just two months, we saw there was a difference in the compost decay. So when those Asian jumping worms were present, we had about half as much compost left in those beds just two months in because they're either directly consuming it or they're stimulating microbes to break it down. So a really notable effect very early on that we saw. So in a practical sense, this could just even just change the frequency with which you're mulching or, or more importantly, composting beds, if that's your main source of organic matter for the system. Same goes for a garden if you're amending them with composts. Um, so that really could change the frequency. And especially if that relates to the release of nitrogen in these soils, it could really throw your fertility off as well. So something to, uh, to think about when you're managing soil structure and fertility. But in the turf system, we also wanted to see, you know, what, what kind of effects do we have? Do casts build up the, uh, the frass material? Does that build up in turf grasses? Um, and sure enough, we did an experiment where we introduced jumping worms to turf grasses in uh, lawn turf grasses, I should say, in June. By the time we get out to August and then October, we had near over a foot per uh, or a pound per square foot of these castings in the lawn. And this is the equivalent of like dumping a bag of coffee onto a tiny pizza box. I mean, it was a, a lot of material that builds up in the, this small area. So you can just see how that effect happens, uh, even just over the course of a single season. So a really dramatic effect that we saw on the lawn. There are still lawns where there is no casting and where earthworms will not move out of those mulch beds. And that's what we're trying to figure out now. Why in some lawn systems do they actually move out and others they stay isolated to the gardens and to the beds? Um, okay, I just have a few slides to finish up on minimizing the spread because I know we're getting close here. On time. Um, the first is, and one of the most important things is learning the signs and symptoms of jumping worms. This is really key, and a lot of people will call and they feel like I've got really active earthworms and I've heard about these jumping worms, that must be what I have. Um, and really being able to distinguish them is pretty important because even though the European species are invasive, um, they can be pretty beneficial. They, they have beneficial effects on aggregate formation in soil, on soil structure preventing soil from erosion because they build that structure and promote fungal growth in the soils and they mineralize nutrients. So being able to distinguish the jumping worms from other species is pretty important. 
Uh, one key part of that is being able to inspect materials, mulches, composts, soils, whether they're coming in in a potted plant that you're about to, um, some vegetable starts that you're about to put out, or as topsoil that you're bringing into your property. Um, a big pile of topsoil is not the easiest thing to sort, so this is something you can do in, in small amounts. Uh, one of the, the strategies we've got. Um, one method that I think is a really good way to try and um, get a better handle on if you have jumping worms or not is to use a mustard flush. And some of you may have heard of this before. It's a pretty straightforward method. It's really just culinary mustard powder. We buy it in big plastic bulk tubs. And it's about a third a cup of mustard powder per gallon of water. And this stuff does not dissolve. It's, you have to really shake it into the water and it kind of cakes up. But you have to shake it up as best as you can and then drench it down onto the soil, probably in a two square foot area. Um, so you get enough that saturates the soil profile, and that will flush the worms out. And this is not a management practice per se. It's really just to monitor to see if you have them in the property. If you do find jumping worms on your site, you confirm what they are. They're pretty easy to dispatch and get rid of. Um, usually use a little Ziploc bag with some rubbing alcohol in it and throw the worms in it. That will kill them pretty quickly. So vinegar works as well. Uh, on the same topic, when you get into this sort of uh, landscape setting, trying to work with bare roots where possible. Now I say where possible because there are a lot of systems where that's not that uh, realistic to do in, or you just can't wash all the soil off of the roots. But if you do have that luxury and the ability to get bare roots or wash them, that's a good way to, um, to ensure that you're at least getting them off of the plants that are going into the ground if they're there. And you will see if adult worms are there, but again, you will not see the cocoons necessarily. Knowing you do have jumping worms in a system, trying to not exchange those materials or plants or soil um, is a really, really important thing to do. And cleaning debris from materials, just given how small and resistant those cocoons are, they could survive in a clump of soil stuck on the side of a shovel for quite a long time. So trying to do a friend a favor and help them put some plantings in uh, really pays to clean off your equipment before you move it or before somebody brings it onto your property as well. And then um, so lastly on this topic, um, checking for castings under mulch and leaf litter. So whether it's a pile of, of leaf litter that's stuck around for the whole season in your yard or a mulch bed. So this is a mulched bed at the Cornell uh, Botanical Garden in Ithaca. And we just took these hard tine rakes, flipped them on their backs, and lightly raked this about a year old mulch off of the, the beds. And this was just boiling with Asian jumping worms underneath it. It really doesn't take much to look for, to find them if they're there. And these are all of their castings underneath the mulch. And you can see some of the worms in the pictures here. So. We collected hundreds out of, out of just a couple beds when we did this. So. But it's really, really helpful if you keep records of materials you use and where you see jumping worms, because it might be as simple as sourcing, find, identifying a source of material where they came from. Um, oftentimes, the people that are dishing these out, they have no idea that these materials might have the worms in them. So contaminated material that you get, obviously not all the soil from a, a planting bed, but if it's coming off of equipment or is a small amount of material, you can put it in a black plastic garbage bag and le leave it out in the sun for at least 10 minutes. And that will raise the temperature in there to kill the adults that are in there and, and some of the cocoons too. Not letting yard waste build up. This is kind of a tough one because we do want those organic amendments, whether it's lawn clippings or um, vegetable matter in the garden. Yeah, you do want that organic matter in there because it builds soil structure and fertility. It's a good nutrient source but not letting large piles of leaf litter build up in lawns. Uh, that, that's a really good, I mean, that's a good practice for turf health in general, but it's, it's also a great way to minimize the habitat quality for jumping worms. And then I say reporting observations as well, because this is something that, um, there's some really great resources out there for connecting with citizen science, people that are trying to log occurrences through invasive species tracking networks. And I cite some of those on, on a couple slides here, so you can uh, write them down. And I could share them as well if you guys want to post them somewhere. So I do want to just, before we stop, mention management, because this is typically where most people start when they contact me. How do I kill these worms? And there, there still are no legal vermicides available out there on the market. And it's because our history with earthworms has been long and twisted. And you know, we, we, initially, we thought they were these terrible vermin. And then we thought they were the best thing on Earth. And no earthworm could do anything bad. And now we have this very nuanced view of it really depends on the context. So, But we still have no legal vermicides available on the market. Um, historically, we used to use irritants on golf courses, on putting greens. This is a picture of someone flushing motor meal into the soil. This is a tea seed extract. This is common in a lot of products. And they would flush, I mean, this is a wheelbarrow from a single green full of earthworms <laughs> just to flush these things off. Because in golf turf, they cast on the putting greens and everybody blames their bad putting game on, uh, on earthworm casts. So, but this is a pretty, it used to be a really common practice. And, um, 
People have tried this. I mean, we have a product called Early Bird, which is a biostimulant. It's actually a fertilizer, biofertilizer, uh, but it has tea seed extract in it. So people have studied it for its ability to, to uh, flush earthworms out of the soil, including jumping worms, and it will do that. But again, you, it, you really can't use it as that. It's something that if you're biofertilizing your site, you could get a double benefit from it. But again, not a control product. Solarization has also come up. Um, this is something that, again, if you have small amounts of debris or soil, I think you could do um, under black plastics. But you know, if you're trying to manage an entire site, maybe a bed you could cover, but um, I think a little more research would need to be done there. As with the final two points, so organic matter management, again, trying to remove uh, large piles. This has been shown to be effective managing soil organic matter content for some of the European species, but we need a little more data with Asian jumping worm to know how effective it is before we full throttle recommend something like that. And then lastly, sand amendments or amendments with um, abrasive aggregate material into soils like zeolite have been studied with European species. Um, but this is a longer term thing. You're really trying to change the mineral nature of your soil, and that's not something that can be really done overnight. But over long term applications, it has been shown to reduce the suitability of the habitat for earthworms. So as I said, not a satis super satisfying list of management options, but that really is where we're at with it now. There are some attempts to look for biocontrols. This is a challenging thing in soil because earthworms are in contact with antagonists and, and um, enemies all the time in soil. So there, there's you could, sort of, you could sort of say they're ecologically used to those things. And a lot of the things we would use to tackle a pest in soil don't necessarily work against things that are living in the soil all the time. So, and that's the case with earthworms. So that's made it pretty challenging. Just want to say thanks before we move on. And I do have a list of resources here that I can share with the organizers as well. Um, if they want to share that, there's some for, if you're interested in citizen science around earthworms or even just tracking sightings and reporting them through IMAP invasives, that's a great network for this. Um, or just looking up some of the great fact sheets we have out there on identifying jumping worms, distingu distinguishing them from others, and some management recommendations as well through Cornell Cooperative Extension and the Wisconsin DNR has some great ones too. Yeah, Kyle, but people are talking about uh, natural predators. So uh, some of the same predators that we have, I would imagine, are, are going to be the same predators for standard earthworms that we have for the jumping worms um, out there. and. Do you see that as, as being viable control? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. I mean, we know there are a lot of really key earthworm predators out there. Moles eat them. Um, we've got a lot of um, larger vertebrates that eat earthworms. Birds like to feed on earthworms. Um, it's not really clear how much of a dent they will make naturally. I mean, obviously, species like that can't quite be augmented uh, in any straightforward way. But um, the one concern is the fact that these earthworms can divide themselves deliberately and fling their tail um, it does give them like a double chance of surviving any predation event. So that that aspect does make things challenging. Um, I do know that there's somebody at the University of Vermont, Joseph Gores, who's also looking at some microbial controls and also a predatory flatworm that we, we do see in the Northeast as a potential biocontrol for them as well. But that work is fairly new, so I, I, uh, I haven't seen an update on the results with that yet. So also a, a couple of questions just on, um, you know, could you destroy the cocoons before they hatch? But I would imagine it's a matter of, you know, getting to those and identifying whether you got cocoons there being a very difficult strategy. Yeah, um, that's a real challenge. You know, it's something that if you have control over the soil and there's not a vulnerable plant in it and it's a small enough volume of soil, I think that you could do some, some pretty good damage, uh, especially if you had access to heat. Um, but that is a pretty unique situation, and I think a lot of situations you don't have much control over those cocoons, which is the challenge. Yeah. Uh, Judith from uh, Mount, uh, went to Mount Cuba and says that the, uh, they, uh, they claim that their, some of their shrubs were actually falling over because of the jumping worms tumbling okay. through the soil. So uh, you, you'd ask people to respond on that, so I thought it was great that she got back to us on that. Yeah, I appreciate that. And we do see them aerify soil down to six to eight inches, so um, it could encompass the entire root system of a shallowly rooted plant. So um, that isn't super surprising, but it's still pretty impressive. <laughs> so thanks, Judith. And the, the mustard uh, that you're using for flush, does it have any negative effect on anything else in the soil? It, uh, that's a good question. We haven't seen uh, real strong non-target effects. Show, uh, we don't really see anything else that has that response that comes to the surface, so I have to say that first. Um, it, it could possibly have some effects, um, but it even doesn't even kill the earthworms. It really just irritates them to the surface, and after a while, when it dilutes, they'll just go back below ground. So, And that's another reason it's not a management practice. 
But I, I would say it's fairly tame as far as the non-target effects on other beneficials in the soil. It'll flush up other species of earthworm as well. But if you're not collecting them to remove them, they'll, they'll go back into the soil afterwards. So, and it, we haven't seen it have any effects on at least the plants we've, we've seen people use it in. So some people have used it in some ornamental plants. And the mustard powder doesn't have any effect on the plant itself if you're flushing around a plant. And we haven't seen any negative effects in turf grasses either. Kyle, thank you very much. Uh, that was really interesting. We appreciate you sharing your expertise with everyone. And next up is uh, Dr. George Hamilton from Rutgers University. And George Hamilton's research interests are uh, areas of implementing integrated pest management, or IPM, in the examination of the pesticide use patterns in New Jersey. Um, also led to the implementation of IPM program in eggplant, which George is responsible for. We're very pleased to have George here because uh, George is always extremely helpful in all of our ag programs and all of our teaching programs and uh, has done a lot to with our pest management program throughout the entire state of New Jersey. George is going to be talking about the brown mammarated stick bug, a spotted lanternfly, and the Asian giant hornet, the murder hornet. Uh, we've been getting a lot of calls on, on all of these this year, uh, and George will tell you about where the Asian giant hornet has been spotted. Fortunately, we don't have it in our area yet. That's correct. George, thanks for being with us today. Oh, thank you for having me, and as Bill said, I'm going to talk about the brown marmorated stink bug. Uh, I'm also going to talk about spotted lanternfly, and I'm going to talk about what should be called the Asian giant hornet and not the murder hornet or the murdering hornet. And I will, I will talk about that uh, when I get to that insect. So I'm gonna start with the brown marmorated stink bug. Um, this is one of my favorite insects from a research standpoint. Um, as Bill said, I've been working with this insect since about, oh, probably 2004, and I've had several graduate students and lots of undergraduates working um, on ways to, to manage um, this insect. Um, so it's not a new insect. It's been in the country over 20 years. Uh, we think that it was first introduced into Allentown, Pennsylvania in the mid-1990s. Uh, it went several years um, before it was properly identified in the Allentown area. Um, a colleague of mine that was with the Extension um, Department at the, at the Lehigh County Extension Office, she was a trained entomologist. Up until her getting involved, everybody thought this, this was just the brown stink bug that's a native to, to um, the United States. Uh, and so she was responsible for, for correcting all of that. We think that it came into the country uh, in bulk freight containers. Uh, we think this because we know for sure that this insect is a very good hitchhiker. And there are lots of reports of brown marmorated stink bug uh, showing up in other areas of the world, uh, imported in bulk containers. Um, they are known to get into cars and ultimately get shipped out of the country to other parts of the world. Um, it is such a problem that in places like New Zealand, uh, any car coming in from a country where brown marmorated stink is known to occur has to go through a heat or chemical treatment process before New Zealand will uh, come into the, to the country. Uh, we know that we have had them here in Jersey since 1999. Um, the first occurrence of it here in the state, we found it in a black light trap uh, that's part of the black light series that our vegetable IPM uh, people run. And it was that detection was actually in the Milford uh, part of the state, which is in Clarendon County. So one of the big questions is where did this insect come from? And so we know because of genetic work that we did uh, one of my students and a, and a postdoc um, with Dr. Uh, Dino Fonseca in our department looked at specimens from all over the world and made the determination that this insect got into the United States uh, from China. And that's something that we are seeing more and more of. In fact, each of the insects I'm going to talk about tonight uh, were insects that were introduced from Asia 
and that's related to the the amount of trade that we do between the U.S. and Asia, and it's also related to how quickly things can move between the two areas of the world. Uh, we ha can get things here in 24 hours with aircraft, and that has contributed greatly uh, to these things getting into into the United States. So here's the map um, of Asia, and it is native in China. It is found in, we know, South Korea, and we assume North Korea as well. It's found in Japan and it's also found in Taiwan. So, you know, it has a fairly wide distribution, and if you look at the areas, especially in Japan where it's found, they're relatively the same latitude that we um, are at, and we feel like that has had something to do with how well it became established uh, here in the mid-Atlantic area of, of the East Coast. Now, I'll very quickly go through, I've got the different life stages on this slide. In your upper left-hand corner are the first instars. These are the newly hatched um, juveniles. They have this nice orange and black coloration. Um, they feed for a period of time on the eggs that they emerge from so that they can pick up symbionts that they need to help them to digest the fluid that they imbibe from plant material. Uh, so that means that they all have sucking mouth parts. Then we go through the, below that is the first instar. It's black, it's pinkish, and it starts to have these white bandings on the antennae that I have circled there. Uh, and then as it moves to the second instar before that, the banding starts to appear on the legs as well. And so as you can see, this goes through um, five nymphal instars. Um, and then on the right, the left right hand side, the fifth instar is at the top. Um, the male is in the middle there and the female is on the bottom right hand corner. Females are generally larger than the males. And if you turn the insect, the adult, over, you can tell females from males um, very easily. The males have a U-shaped suture at the tip of the bottom of their abdomen that's very, very easy to see. So one of the things we did when this insect came into the, to, uh, New Jersey was to create a monitoring site. And some of you may have actually uh, made reports to this uh, with spotted lanternfly. We also have one of these that I'll talk about where people can email us um, through the website that's that's on the um, New Jersey Air Experiment Station website um, and tell us where they are located, where they found this. We encourage people to send us a picture. Uh, so that we can verify indeed that it is what we're looking for, and in this case, it's the brown marmorated stink bug. Uh, you'd be surprised at what people think are stink bugs. My favorite, if you've ever seen the the, the parasite parasitoid wood wasp uh, that has the long ovipositor inserts under the bark of woods uh, to lay its eggs on bark beetles that are infesting the tree. Someone sent that in, sent us a picture of that and told us that was a stink bug. So we need to verify these things just so that um, we know that we've got the right thing. And so we've used this for years. This is still in effect. Um, we have used this actually to track the spread of this insect throughout the United States. I will show you a, uh, a map of where it is spread in the United States. So here is the U.S. distribution when I first uh, became familiar with this uh, in 2003. Uh, it was present in Pennsylvania, it was present in Maryland, and it was present in, in New Jersey. Today, um, every state on this map that is in gray are states where this insect is not known to occur or has not been found in the state. Notice that it is also spread up into Canada. And so again, in Canada, the, the provinces in gray 
or the provinces um, that do not have this insect. Um, this is important because it has actually had some implications on movement of agricultural materials uh, to and from uh, the U.S. And, and Canada. And as I alluded to earlier, it's also had an impact to New Zealand and also over in Europe. I'll also point out with this map on um, the areas that are in, in red, or just feel this insect is having the, the biggest um, agricultural impact um, in their area. Um, orange is uh, slightly lower. And if you go all the way down to green, those are where it's just been detected and um, is not known to occur. So why do we worry about this? Well, in Asia, and especially in Japan, this is a outbreak past, um, but not every year. And so every six to eight years, they'll have a big outbreak of this insect, and they will get a lot of damage on their agricultural um, commodities. It is a pest of soybeans, it's a pest of vegetables, it's also a pest of tree fruit, and I'll show you pictures of some of that damage. Um, in these areas, in years of outbreak and in years in between, uh, it is a nuisance pest in houses and other structures. Uh, if you're familiar with this insect, this is probably how you became familiar with it, because it does exactly the same thing here in uh, New Jersey and other parts of the United States. Uh, so here in North America and in Europe, and this insect is now widespread in Europe as well. Um, and I will say that the DNA says that some of it came from the U.S. and some of it came from China. So we don't, we can't take all of the uh, blame for that. But it's a consistent nuisance pest. Uh, we were the first to show that this was a a pest problem in Pennsylvania and New Jersey uh, in tree fruit back in, in 2009. And shortly uh, after we published this, uh, and actually our data was from 2007, um, this was shown to become a very bad pest in Virginia and West Virginia in apples and, and peaches in 2000 and 2009. Uh, so bad that growers just let all of their fruit fall off the tree because it was so damaged they were not able to sell it. So this is a typical uh, life cycle. It has one to two generations per year. My guess, because of the temperature work that we've done with this insect, uh, would be that this year, because of how hot it has been, uh, this insect is probably going to have two generations. But typically, um, it overwinters in structures. Uh, usually in wall voids and in people's attics. Uh, periodically, as they uh, we get a warm up like we do in, in New Jersey during the winter, they will come down into the the living area of the house. Um, they're basically looking for a way out, uh, and they don't really do any any damage structurally to the to the, the building or the home, although um, they do have a tendency to defecate um, liquid material. Um, that's been shown that in some cases, if it's done around windows and there are drapes, it will stain, stain the grapes. Uh, in the springtime, and here in New Jersey, that would be mid to late May, um, they start to move out of the houses. Um, the adults, and, and it's the adult states that they overwinter as, uh, move out looking for food sources. Um, once they fed a little bit, um, then they start looking for mates. Um, the females will let mate and then go off and they, they will lay their eggs. Um, and that's usually in conjunction with something like tree fruit um, or vegetables or whatnot, someplace where their juvenile stages will have something to feed on. They go through that one to two generations per year and then they move again back to the structures. Uh, and again, that's where most people come in contact with them. And so sometimes these movements into people's homes or in structures 
can occur in extremely large numbers. Uh, this is a picture of a security light on the outside wall of a bank at night um, down in West Virginia that a colleague, Dr. Tracy Lesky, uh, let me borrow. Um, and all of those are stink bugs that are surrounding that light. And so we have actually made use of that behavior with our system, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a second. But if you notice there, there's also some green in there. Those are the native green stink bugs that we have. So the brown marmorate is not the only one that, that is attracted to these lights. So there are a lot of common questions that I've gotten over the year. Um, the first one is the smell toxic to me. And my answer to that is there has been no work that has shown that it, that it is toxic. Uh, to humans or to pests. Um, if it's, it gets into the mouth, um, it can be distasteful, but it's not going to harm anybody. And there are sometimes two smells. They get the name stink bug because of the chemical they release that's there for defensive uh, purposes, but they also have a, uh, an aggregation pheromone that's really in the fall to bring individuals together. I assume for mating purposes, um, that um, has a smell. Some people think it smells like um, cilantro. Um, another question is, do they bite? Uh, not deliberately. They're not like a mosquito. They don't feed on blood. They only feed on plant juices. Uh, but there are reports where it, at night, if somebody rolls over and, you know, onto one, they may try to stick their um, proboscis their mouth part into somebody, but they're not doing it um, for uh, food purposes. Uh, do they transmit diseases? They transmit no human diseases. Uh, there's one report of them in Asia uh, causes causing witch's broom of, of princess trees. Um, that basically is a disease that causes the inner nodes to not expand on on branches. Um, of the tree, and so it ends up looking like a, a uh, witch's broom, hence the name. Um, I've already covered the structural damage. Again, they don't really do any structural damage um, to the home. And another one that I, I get, or I used to get quite a lot, is if I smash them, will that attract more next year? And the answer to that is no. The chemical that would be released um, it doesn't last long enough in the environment for, for that to happen. So that, that's not something that, that they do. Okay, so in the mid-Atlantic, 2010 uh, was probably the year that everybody became aware of this stink bug. That was the year that we had the highest populations that, um, to that date, actually. Um, and our, our joke within the research community was, you know, you've made the big time uh, when the New York Times is saying bed bugs move over, the stink bugs have landed, because at that time, bed bugs were the number one insect of question of, and of fear uh, here in the United States and others, and this insect actually made um, that change. And so this is a picture um of two people that are sweeping dead stink bugs off of their um, patio into buckets and they are moving thousands of them. Uh, one of our colleagues actually lived in Maryland, um, had a home that was highly infested. Being a scientist, he did a scientific study and he collected and counted every stink bug over a one-year period in his home, and he collected over 26,000 stink bugs that were in his house. Uh, fortunately, as he found them, he, he did some of the things that we recommend people do. And today, he doesn't have the problem that he had at the time. Okay, um, I just want to go over quickly some of their hosts. They have a very wide host range, over 200 known different hosts. Uh, here in the United States, especially in the East, um, Eastern Redbud, Wild Cherry, uh, Mulberry, 
and uh, black walnut are uh, big hosts that they go to in the springtime. Uh, we have Asian hosts here as well, though, uh, Catalpa, uh, Polonia, um, the Princess Tree, uh, Tree of Heaven, which is very important. Uh, they love this tree, and we think this has also contributed to their movement throughout the United States, uh, because if you drive along any interstate, uh, you will find this tree all along the interstates, and it is everywhere. Uh, Mimosa and Catalpa are two other of the Asian spring hosts uh, that they are fond of. I mentioned that they feed on a lot of different fruit. I just show these pictures. I'm not going to say a lot about them. It just kind of gives you an idea of how many different fruit varieties that they, they feed on, in, including things like, um, and not pictured here, but blueberries. Uh, they will feed on corn. They feed on both uh, field corn and sweet corn. Um, unlike our natives, they are able to stick their uh, mouth parts through the husk directly into developing kernels and damaging those kernels. On, and on that, that picture on the left-hand side, each one of those dark spots is where a stink bug has stuck their uh, mouth parts through the husk and into the corn. This is what the damage looks like in something like beans. Um, this is what it looks like in peppers and in tomatoes. Uh, it shows up as these yellow to white spotted halo areas. If you re remove the peel, as we, I've done there in the lower uh, left-hand corner, you'll see all this necrotic tissue underneath. Um, they inject an enzyme in their saliva when they feed to break down the plant tissues and then they suck it back up. Um, and so that's what you're seeing there with that necrotic tissue. Uh, they also feed on trees. Um, they can put their mouth parts through the bark of thin bark trees. They will remove fluid from the trees. Uh, we're not sure what impact this has on the trees, but we do know that it, it does do things like attract ants and wasps to the trees because where they feed the tree, and you can see some of the wet areas on that one picture on the left, um, they will exude fluid from those wounds that the ants and the uh, wasp will take advantage of. This is the last one for the injury. This is um, soybeans. And so we have something that hadn't been seen before. Um, in soybeans, and so this is a late season field. Uh, we know that because where the unaffected arrow is, those are soybeans that are drying down like they're supposed to do in the fall. Um, all of those green areas are soybeans that have been attacked by the brown marmorated stink bug, and so they're feeding for some reason on delays the, the, the die back uh, and dry down of the soybeans, which creates um, problems with harvesting. Okay, um, management, uh, well, we want to use good IPM principles, and we do have a lot of good things that we can do, uh, st starting with building modifications. Um, we tell people that if you, you know, check your windows, your doors, um, if you have gaps between the walls and the uh, casings around those things on the outside of the house, you need to seal them. That will help uh, keep them out of the house. Um, if you have vents to your attic, they need to be screened so that they can't get through. Um, and if you have um, air conditioner, wall air conditioners or window air conditioners, they are able to get through those. So if it's a permanent uh, wall unit, it needs to be sealed around so they can't get in. And if it's a window unit or it's not a permanent wall unit, uh, needs to be removed in the fall uh, so they don't have a way to get into the house. Uh, we do have traps available uh, for monitoring purposes. Uh, early on when these traps started to show up, people were hoping, especially the people selling them, 
that they could be used as a control method. Uh, that does not work, but they are good for monitoring when they are around. In agriculture, uh, we have worked on systems where we use those to track them, say in a peach orchard to specific parts of the peach orchard, and then we make an insecticide um, application just to that part of the orchard, and it, it, it does help manage that insect. We don't have to spray the whole orchard. Uh, we do have chemical controls. We have lots of chemical controls. Uh, from a homeowner standpoint, um, something that has probably either bifenthrin or dinotefuran, and those are very common um, materials, insecticides that, that are available uh, to the general public, uh, will kill these insects. Um, there are other materials that are effective. However, um, there's evidence that with many of them, um, they get sick, but then they recover and go back to feeding and whatnot. Um, the only thing else that I'll say about the chemicals is that um, if you're going to spray something, uh, please uh, check your labels and make sure that the labels um, have what you're going to treat on, in, on the label uh, so that it's a legal application. Um, also with buildings, if you're going to spray, which we do recommend, uh, we recommend that you only spray around the windows um, and doors. You don't need to spray the, the, um, the whole side of the house. And then there's habitat management, and that's basically choosing your plant material. Um, if you have plants in the landscape that get impacted by this insect every year, it might be a good idea uh, to replace it with something that they don't feed on and that will help with them um, not coming into the structure. So I'm gonna end my discussion of this insect by saying, where did they go? If you're like me, you've noticed that their populations have declined over the last 10 years. Uh, they are still around. Um, they still do some damage in agricultural systems, but not like they used to do. Um, so what is going on? Um, the current thought is that what's going on is what usually happens with an, with an invasive species. Um, they usually get in. While we're bringing George back, I see we do have some questions on there. Okay. So while we're doing, let me finish what I was saying about the stink okay. bug. So what we think is going on here, why have they disappeared? numbers are lower. Uh, it has something to do, we think, with the weather pattern that we've had. Um, we've had some mild winters and we've had some very mild summers. Um, they like heat. Um, if it's not really warm, um, they won't make it through that second generation. And so that means that there's less going in, in adults going into overwintering. And so there's less of them to come out um, in spring. Cold temperatures, we know that there is a cold temperature threshold below which they die. It's about 10 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, so a couple of these winters, we had some very cold winters. And so we think that had um, an impact as well. The other thing that we think is going on is what we think is going on um, is when invasive species, especially insects, come from other countries and, and come into the United States, um, they usually come without their natural enemies. And so very early on, we didn't really have anything that we thought was feeding on these to any large extent. Uh, today, we don't think that that's the case. Uh, we think that a lot of our native predators have clued in on them. They now see them as a food source, especially feeding on the nymphs. And so we think that's going, that's what's happened. 
um, to a large extent. We also have a parasitoid, a little tiny egg wasp that I'm working with um, as well, that uh, is in quarantine with USDA. It has made it into the United States on its own and has become fairly widespread in the states that have, that have had the problems in the past. And so we're not really sure how long it's been here, so it, it may actually be having an impact as well. All right. Well, my power just came back, but I think we'll stay with this. So um, I'll just start with, this is spotted lanternfly. This is an adult. This is probably an adult female. Um, I'm saying that because of the coloration of the abdomen. It gets very, she gets very yellow when she starts to, to develop her eggs and her abdomen swells to a, a large um, extent. Uh, this is another invasive plant hopper. It is native to northern China. Um, this insect um, became invasive in other parts of Asia before coming to the U.S. So it is invasive in South Korea, in Taiwan, Vietnam, and Japan. Um, unfortunately, like brown marmorated stink bug, it feeds on over 70 hosts. So it has a wide host range, and it has a preference for feeding on plants with high sugar content. And so this is another insect that is a fluid feeding insect. It has sucking mouth parts, um, and it inserts those mouth parts into the plants. And because of its size, especially as an adult, and I'll talk about that in a second, um, it takes large amounts of fluid through its system, and that impacts the, the health of the plant. Um, I've also um, added a couple of other uh, lantern flies here. Uh, that green one is another one that's native to um, Asia, uh, but we do have them uh, here in the United States, and, and that, that blue and red striped um, leaf hopper that is a full gourd. It's in the same grouping as the lantern fly. Um, and so we do have some native species, but they're not nearly as big and they, they do not cause the damage uh, that we are starting to see um, from the um, spotted lantern fly. So this is something that the United States um, Department of Ag did. Um, this, they did some modeling and look at the potential distribution for this insect. Uh, you can see that the eastern part of Pennsylvania and all of New Jersey, uh, Delaware, Maryland, parts of Virginia and West Virginia and some of the Midwestern states, and then the Central Valley of California are areas where their modeling thought this insect might be uh, had the potential to, to be um, present, um, and yellow is, is slightly lower chance of it, and and low uh, green is lower. Um, so I pull out the red because uh, that in the eastern so far is pretty much where we're seeing this insect uh, occur. So the original. Um, find uh, was in Berks County, Pennsylvania in 2014. <clears throat> um, it is thought to have been um, transported from Asia into the United States in a shipment of stone. Um, this insect likes to lay its eggs, and that's the stage that it overwinters as on a variety of materials, and they think because the egg masses look like mud, basically, um, that they were on the, the uh, stone and nobody picked it up. Uh, of course, nobody was probably looking for it either uh, when it got distributed um, or moved to the United States. Uh, fortunately, the receiver, uh, when they hatched and he started to see these insects he'd never seen before, uh, reported it, and so the Department of Ag uh, got into um, dealing with this. So this map is current as of March 13th, 2020, and the blue areas, um, and you can kind of line it up with that other map I showed you, 
Now, those blue areas are where this insect is in quarantine, and that means that its movement um, has to be monitored and things have to be done to try and restrict it from moving. So mm, all of the, except um, Sussex County along the Delaware um, is in quarantine here in New Jersey. Um, there are many states, including two counties, uh, counties, two counties in Pennsylvania out in the Pittsburgh area that are in quarantine. And then we have a county in Delaware, a county in Maryland, and a couple of counties in Virginia and, and West Virginia. The red dots are where this insect has been found, uh, but not known to establish. Okay, so our first find was in, in um, 2018 um, when um, and the, the Department of Ag established a three-county quarantine. Um, that was expanded in 2019 as, as we um, saw this insect starting to move out into other areas. Uh, one of the things that we have done and the Department of Ag has also done is to set up reporting websites and phone numbers. We don't have phone numbers at Rutgers, but we do have a website and that's the address for it. Uh, and what we are doing um, is asking the general public to use our website and for growers to use the Department of Ag websites. Initially, the Department of Ag was accepting general public, uh, but it became too overwhelming for them, so we've, we've divvied it up. Um, I will warn you that if you try to call the, the Department of Ag website um, because of COVID and the furloughs that are going on, it's very hard to get through on their, on their phone lines. I would use their reporting website, uh, and again, you please use ours. Uh, if you do, please um, tell us what town the sighting is in and send us a picture. Of, if you forget to do either one of those, we're going to email you back and ask you to do that. Because again, as I mentioned with the stink bug, we really need that for verification purposes. And so we have lots of research pro programs going on here. I am in, have students looking at their development on different hosts under different temperatures. Uh, Dr. Ann Nielsen is looking at their spread in vineyards throughout the state, uh, which is where the primary problem is right now uh, with them. Um, and there are others at Rutgers that they've actually developed a way to uh, find their DNA on plant material uh, before we can actually visibly find this insect in, say, a, a vineyard. Um, a little bit about the reports. This just is a graph that shows you that, you know, things are increasing. And so the gray line is 2020, and we, we are far above in terms of the number of reports in New Jersey than we were with the total reports we had in, in the previous two years. And so this is data uh, from the beginning of August. Um, if I was to show you an up-to-date graph, uh, we, we've had close to uh, 1,500 reports this year. So I will say that th this insect is now, we're getting reports from, from most of the counties in the state. Um, this is uh, using the reports a way to look at its movement. And so you can see in 2018, we had very few reports. Um, in 19, we, we had a higher concentration in the original two counties, and we started to see it in other counties and then in this year. And again, this corresponds to that graph I showed you. If I showed it to you today, we, we'd have um, red dots in most of the counties uh, here in New Jersey. So that's the adult. It's very colorful. When it opens its wings, it has that nice red and yellow color. Most people think this is a moth. It's not. It's, it's a big leaf hopper. Uh, the adults are about an inch long, and they have the spots on their, on their wings. 
Um, the coloration, the size and the spots, those are the key characters uh, for identifying the adults. Um, adults lay the eggs in the fall from August to November. Uh, that is a picture of the, um, the egg mass. Again, it, it looks like a, a patch of, of mud or, uh, on the structure. Um, the eggs hatch in the spring. Um, that happens about mid-May here in New Jersey. Uh, that's for Pennsylvania. We're about the same. Um, they have a very good hatch rate, 16 and 90 percent, and um, they like cool temperatures. In fact, they have to have cool temperatures uh, to get good um, egg hatch. Uh, they go through four nymphal instars. Um, the first three instars are these black and, and white spotted little creatures. Um, as they develop further, they take on a red appearance with black and white spots. Uh, they are very mobile. Um, they can move um, three and a quarter feet per minute. They've actually looked at this in the laboratory. They've also looked at their jumping and they can jump approximately 16 feet in uh, 15 minutes. So what that means is because they're highly mobile, they're also very hard to catch. And this is one of the problems we're, we're experiencing with people trying to take pictures. Uh, they move too quickly. Um, so Tria Heaven is a contributor to this one as well. Um, they like Tria Heaven. It was originally thought that they had to feed on Tria Heaven um, during their life cycle. We're not quite sure that that's actually true, but they will be found on Tria Heaven. Uh, throughout the year, um, and the good news is that this insect only goes through one generation per year. So this is just the the ins the progression. So the overwinter again is eggs. Um, the eggs hatch in May through June, and then they go through those three instars. Uh, right now, for the last two weeks, they have been in that fourth instar stage. Um, two weeks ago in uh, South Jersey, we started to get our first reports of, of um, adults, um, and this week we are getting re adult reports um, from pretty much all over the state. Um, in July, December, those adults are around. They are feeding on a variety of plants. Uh, they may females uh, start laying eggs uh, between September and December. These are the preferred hosts. Um, the ones in red on the right side are the ones of concern. These are the things that we know they can complete development on. What that means is that they can feed on just that and go from the, the um, egg stage to the adult stage. I have hops on here. Um, there's some debate about that right now, uh, whether or not that's true, but the other ones they definitely can complete um, their development on. We do have non-chemical tactics. Uh, there's been a lot of effort in Pennsylvania and the Department of Ag here in New Jersey has done it as well to scrape off the egg masses. Uh, you can do that with a credit card. And in fact, uh, the Department of Ag was handing out scrapers, uh, basically credit cards, uh, with information about reporting sightings and whatnot. Um, if you're going to do this, you want to do it from October to May before they hatch and then uh, put them in plastic bags and dispose of them, um, or you can put them in alcohol or hand sanitizer and that will kill them as well. Uh, you can do tree banding like we used to do with gypsy moth um, back in the 70s and 80s. Uh, you wrap those bands around the tree um, and they have stick them, and as the adults move up and down the tree, they get stuck on it. Uh, you need to, to re change those bands frequently uh, because the research has come out looking at those bands and their effectiveness. And once they get to a certain density on the bands, the other ones just walk over the top of them and don't get stuck. You should also know that if you're going to use this, there is some issues uh, with what we call bycatch. Um, these bands do catch other things, in, including uh, butterflies, uh, small birds, and in some cases, um, there's been reports that lizards have gotten caught on these as well. So you need to think about that if you're going to use the tree banding. 
we do have a recommended program where if you have tree of heaven on your property, uh, you cut down and treat the stumps to kill the roots um, for 90% of the trees on your property. And then you can use the remaining 10% um, as a trap tree. And the idea here is to attract them to those trees and then you treat those trees uh, with dinotepharan, which is one of the, the, the better insecticides for this. Um, if you're going to cut down the trees, um, if you can, cut down the females so that they don't contribute any seeds to the seabed that could produce seedlings for the next year. And then you just have to do that again. A lot of people don't know that what the female trees do. Um, I've shown, got two pictures here um, of the um, female tree. Those yellow flowers are very easy to see as you drive along the road. And this time of year, they're turning that yellow, reddish, and eventually brownish color. Um, if you don't have um, tree of heaven, on your property, uh, we don't recommend you spraying unless you actually find it on, on your property. And then there there are uh, insecticides that are listed there, um, including some natural materials, if you see them. Uh, just again, make sure you follow the, the label directions and the, the uh, make sure that the plant material you're going to spray is listed on the label. Okay, uh, what's at risk? Uh, honeydew production um, from these from this insect. Um, if you're familiar with aphids and lace bugs feeding and defecating honeydew, and it gets on structures and cars and plant material, that causes problems because of the sooty mold that develops in a forest situation. That can be a problem. It's actually been shown that when there's large populations. They are excreting so much honeydew that it gets on the understory plants, and those plants are dying because of the sooty mold um, interfering with them photosynthesizing. In agriculture, uh, wine grapes um, is where the big problem is because of that deposition in the sooty mold, um, also because of removing lots and lots of fluid out of the out of the vines uh, to where in Pennsylvania they have had some some um, vineyards where they've lost 90 to 100 percent of their vines uh, in one year. Very quickly. So last thing I'll talk about is the Asian giant hornet, aka the Asian murdering hornet. Uh, that's not really its name. Um, it's been coined that in Japan um, because of the activity the adults do um, in killing honeybees so they can rob their pollen to feed their own young. Um, but the, the real name for it is Asian giant hornet. Uh, it is the world's largest hornet. Um, that's the face of the individual. Um, this is the easiest way to tell whether it's an Asian giant hornet or something else. Um, the head is orange with black eyes. And I'll show you some of the things that we are we have here in New Jersey that people are thinking are them for comparison. Uh, it's n native to temperate and tropical Asia, and it is very aggressive uh, to, especially for some reason in Japan, they do have 30 to 50 reported deaths uh, from stinging from this insect every year. And that stinging is because they, they can sting multiple times. That is, that's the full creature. Um, it's about two inches long, and so that person is brave enough to hold it so you, you can see um, how large it actually is. Um, this is what it looks like in comparison to the, the European hornet. Um, the European hornet is present here in New Jersey, and when the reports about this um, new hornet came out in the New York Times, we started to get lots of pictures of people sending samples um, this spring, which is when the European hornet is out. Um, and uh, that is not what this is. And if you look at the coloration of the head and the coloration of the abdomen, there is definitely a difference in terms of the coloration. Um, and the European hornet is also not as big. Uh, this is a cicada killer. 
Uh, just recently, I'm starting to get emails with pictures of this one. This is, if you're familiar with it, a, another rather large wasp. Um, and people are confusing it with the Asian giant hornet. And so that's not the Asian giant hornet. George, I had one of these flying to my truck the other day with a cicada. It was actually attacking a cicada at the time. Yeah, yeah. And, so what um, it was... Huge, huge. Yeah, they are huge, but they don't sting humans. You have to really agitate them. Uh, so what was happening was that uh, wasp that's a female, she's stinging the cicada, which paralyzes it, and then she will take it and drag it down a hole that's usually in sandy turf areas or sandy around trees, um, and she'll take it to the bottom, lay an egg on it, that egg hatches, and that's what the larvae uh, feeds on to become an adult. Okay, um, so first occurrence in the U.S. Uh, was in 2019. A queen was found during winter in Washington State. Um, they found some more individuals again this year, so they're not sure whether that means that this is established, and if it is, how well established it is in Washington. But the only reports of this have been from Washington. It has not been found in any other part of the U.S. Uh, as you might expect, um, Washington is under quarantine, and so their Department of Act is taking measures to try and find, actively find uh, locations uh, where this might be present, and they are looking in areas where there are known beekeepers because, again, this wasp likes to attack uh, honeybees uh, for the pollen. So, as I said, 30 to 50 deaths per year in Japan. Um, they are deadly to honeybees. They do also attack other bees, bumblebees and, and whatnot. Uh, you can see here that's a murder hornet or an Asian giant hornet underneath that pile of honeybees, they're all trying to kill it. It will survive that. And basically what it does, those large mandibles are used to, to cut the heads off. And then once they've destroyed the hive, um, then they go in and they uh, take all the pollen and they feed it to take it back to their nest and feed it to their larvae. Again, here's the two Native wasps are the two here in the United States in comparison. Um, there's not a lot of information out there yet in, in the United States, but the thing that I really want to say is we do not have that in New Jersey yet, and hopefully we won't. So, Bill, if we've got time, I'm ready for questions. And again, I apologize for the power going out. George, we had some questions about control. What are they using out in Washington right now to control these guys? Probably something that's not labeled for home for use, <laughs> to be quite honest with you. Um, there are very few products that are actually labeled for killing Hymenoptera. We usually think of them as being labeled for killing things like yellow jackets and carpenter bees and whatnot. So I haven't seen any data in the literature yet as to what actually does a very good job of killing these things. I'm sure they know, because you know, it is something that is in Asia, and I'm sure there's been some work. I just haven't seen it. But my guess is it's probably going to be some kind of pyrethroid insecticide. So in terms of Georgia, some questions came in about isolating this. How how can they really contain an insect like this? So what, what is the strategy to contain this so that it doesn't go beyond Washington? Honestly, there's really probably no way that they can contain it. Um, the best they can do is go to places where they would likely think to find it, which would be bee yards. And so, you know, they, they're surveying beekeepers um, and their surrounding area. Um, public education, they're doing a lot of public education as, as well. But, you know, quite honestly, if this thing got established, um, it may take a while, but it eventually, um, it's going to move out into other areas. Um, that's what happened with the European hornet. It, it hasn't been here in the United States all that long. Um, but, you know, it got in, um, either through multiple introductions or an introduction 
of individuals that actually, because they have to survive. If they don't survive the first year, they usually don't don't establish, and that's true of any invasive insect. George, um, can can this cross with other bees? Probably not. Okay. Probably not. This isn't this isn't like the situation with honeybees and the Africanized bees. Okay. Because it's uh, in different uh, uh, realm, it's not. There's no way that it's going to be able to cross over and make you more aggressive. Whatever happened with that with the Africanized bees? Did did that? Um, what happened to prevent okay. the spread of that and and to keep it from? Uh, they didn't. They didn't. They couldn't. Oh, okay. It made it's 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 in Arizona. It's in Southern California. Okay. What uh, keeps it from moving further and faster than it has? Probably the deserts, I would think. Okay. Yeah. So then you know they didn't think it would get through the passes over the Andes, but it did. And so then there are actually companies um, in Arizona and Southern California um, that that's what they do. Um, somebody gets a hive in, in a wall of their house, and they call them, and they come, and they they take them away. And, de and they deal with that. George, we do have some questions while we have your expertise online. We're seeing a lot of uh, carpenter bees this year and a lot of European uh, uh, hornets as well. So what, what can we do to control the, both the carpenter? Because there's a lot of carpenter bees. For some reason, we're getting a lot of reports of them this year. So what, what's the best control? Uh, I, I, think the, I think the mild winter has something to do with that. We probably had more survive the winter than we would normally do. Carpenter bees, they like to attack wood that either hasn't been treated or painted or where the paint or the stain is starting to fail. Okay. And so one thing you can do is to try and um, keep your paint, you know, good paint surfaces. You know, and they like to go into the fascia and, and whatnot. Um, so that that will help <clears throat> um, if you see them um, buzzing around start looking for holes um, you might find them in places that you wouldn't expect them um, so I've had problems at my house and um, the first place they they managed to get a foothold was actually underneath my bow window they were, and I didn't even think there because it's not painted. And once I took care of it and painted it, I haven't had a problem. So there are insecticides. You can buy insecticides. There are aerosols um, at, at the, you know, the, the uh, garden centers and whatnot. It's probably going to be a pyrethroid again. And you just need to make sure that you buy something that has carpenter bees as a pest that it, you can use it to control. Okay. How about the traps that you see out there for the honeybees? I, I've seen some people use those, and they do catch quite a few in there. Are they fairly traps effective? Traps for, the, for the honeybees? Or no, for not the, for honeybees, for carpenter bees, sorry. Okay. Um, I'm not real familiar with those. I don't have any experience with them. Uh, they probably will attract some, but they won't probably attract all. Or catch all. Okay. How about the European uh, hornets that are out there that you were talking about before? What's the best well, way? If, if you have a nest of a European hornet, my suggestion would be hire a professional to take care of it. They are very aggressive, and they're not like a honeybee. Um, they can sting multiple times. They are active in the wintertime as well. They, they don't go dormant like a lot of I'm an opera do. Their nests, they remain active. Um, they like to build nests uh, at the bottoms of shrubbery in the soil, in the root system. And that's where people will see them and they think that it, that are like um, bald faced hornets where once we get a few good frosts, that's the end of it and you can deal with it. And that's not necessarily the case. They remain active and they can come out and sting. Now, for a lot of these species, is it the queen that survives through the winter and finds shelter, and then the, pop, the population of the rest of them decreases rapidly? That's I was seeing that on a couple of them. 
Generally, that's the case, but that, that does vary depending on the species. Hey, George, when you do get stung, one question I did see there is what's the best way to, right after you get stung, uh, to handle the pain of being stung? I guess ice and removing that stinger as quickly as possible if you do have well, a finger stung. Well, if, if, if it's a honeybee, yeah, if, if the stinger is still in you, if it's a honeybee sting, Right. Um, and it's the gland is connected. It is still pumping poison, um, the toxin into your system. Um, so yeah, remove that. Um, there won't be a stinger if you're stung by a wasp. They don't lose their their stingers when they sting. That's why they can sting multiple times. Well, and the other thing I would say, you need to be careful. So if you get stung and you you start to feel that you're having difficulty breathing. Yeah, get, get, you need, to, you need to get to get help, medical help, because that that Maybe. is a might be an indicator you're having anaphylactic shock. I had actually read some stories about people being stung by this um, giant hornet, and they were talking about how painful that was because of the just the sheer size, and they, they said there was nothing equivalent to that. It was extremely painful. But the people, the people that were that. Are, are known to have passed away. Um, you, you can look at that in the literature, and there are people that were stung multiple times. It wasn't just from one sting. Well, that's uh, it's good news that they're not here. Uh, yes. <laughs> because we, we get calls all the time, and people think they have them, and it's usually the cicada killer or the European hornet. George, right. thank you so much for sharing your wisdom with everyone, and, and I would like to thank all of our guests and participants today that uh, took the time to stay with us, and we hope to see you again later uh, in the fall. If you've liked the programming that we were doing, please drop us an email and drop us some comments today that you'd like to, uh, you know, if there's any particular topics you'd like to see, and I know Angela Monahan is cooking up some good things for the fall in our office. So, Angela, you want to tell me about some of the good things you got cooking up for the fall, just a, a general overview? Sure. So in the fall, we'll be continuing with the Are You Ready to Garden program, and some topics that we were discussing for the fall would be um, applied pest and disease control, basics of flower and herb gardening, plant propagation at home, and sustainability in the home and garden. So just uh, more so focusing on horticultural topics and, um, and different things that you can do at home and um, and kind of understand your home and garden a little bit better. I would like to thank everyone, especially George and Kyle tonight for sharing all of their expertise. All right, take care everyone and, and have a, a great evening and stay healthy and we hope to see you again in the not too distant future and hopefully we'll see you later in the fall for Are You Ready to Garden? Take care.